Hey guys, this is Vyom Joshi with Superior North. Welcome back to my channel. Today, we will be talking about Medtronic, which is one of the world's largest manufacturer of implantable biomedical devices. We'll review the company's annual report to get a better idea of its business model. Then we'll look at the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. We'll perform a discounted fee cash flow DCF analysis to find the intrinsic value of the company. And finally, do an expected rate of return calculation to see if you were to invest in Medtronic at the current stock price, what kind of return can we expect on this investment? So let's dive in and review Medtronic. Hey guys, let's start off by looking at Medtronic's annual report for the fiscal year 2020. On page 12 of the report, the company provides a business overview. It states that it has more than 72 million patients. It's operating in more than 150 countries. It has more than 90,000 employees. It has spent about $2.3 billion in research and development and has more than 49,000 patents. Medtronic's headquartered in Dublin, Ireland is among the world's largest medical technology, services and solutions companies, alleviating pain, restoring health and extending life for millions of people around the world. Its customers include hospitals, clinics, third-party healthcare providers, distributors, and other institutions, including governmental healthcare programs and group purchasing organizations. Next, on page 110 of the report, the company provides a structural overview of its business. Medtronic states that the company's organizational structure is based upon four principal operating and reportable segments, the cardiac and vascular group, the minimally invasive therapeutics group, the restorative therapeutics group, and the diabetes group. The primary products and services from which the cardiac and vascular group segment derives its revenue include products for the diagnostic, treatment, and management of cardiac rhythmic disorders and cardiovascular disease. The primary products and services from which the minimally invasive therapeutics group segment derives its revenue include those focused on diseases of the respiratory system, gastrointestinal tract, renal system, lungs, pelvic region, kidneys, obesity, and other preventable complications. Next, the primary products and services from which the restorative therapies group segment derives its revenue include those focused on the neurostimulation therapies and drug delivery systems for the treatment of chronic pain as well as various areas of the spine and brain along with pelvis health and conditions of ear, nose and throat. Finally, the primary products from which the diabetes group segment derives its revenue include those focused on diabetes management including insulin pumps, continuous glucose monitoring systems and insulin pump consumables. After that, Medtronic provides us a table where it lists out the segment operating profits across its four operating groups. We can see that the cardiac and vascular group brings in about $3.7 billion, and the minimally invasive therapeutics group brings in about $3 billion, followed by the restorative therapeutics group, which brings in about $2.9 billion, and finally, the diabetes group brings in about $546 million. The total segment operating profit is about $10.224 billion. When we compare the company's segment operating profit of the year 2020 to that of 2019, we can see that all operating segments saw a decline in the year 2020. Next, the company talks about its total assets and depreciation expense. For the year 2020, the company's total assets amounted to about $91 billion, out of which the minimally invasive therapeutics group accounted for about $40 billion. When we compare the depreciation expense to that of the company's total assets, we can see that the company depreciates about 10% of the company's total assets every year. Finally, looking at Medtronic geographic information, in this table we can see that for the net sales in the year 2020, the total was about $29 billion, out of which about $15 billion came from the United States. In other words, about 50% of the company's net sales comes from the United States. Similarly, when we look at the plant property and equipment, we can see that about three-fourths of the company's plant property and equipment is located in the United States. Lastly, Medtronics clarifies that no single customer represented over 10% of the company's consolidated net sales in fiscal year 2020, 2019, or 2018. Now that we have a brief understanding of Medtronics' business, its four operating groups, and its profitability, let's review the company's fundamentals by focusing on its key ratios. Hey guys, now let's look at Medtronics' key ratios. I'm on Morningstar looking at Medtronics. Under key ratios, we have the financials. The first item on the list is the revenue. The revenue is the top line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that the company brings in via sales. Back in 2011, the company's revenue was about $15.9 billion. And for the year 2020, it was about $28.9 billion. Over the past 10 years, the company's revenue has been trending upwards. Medtronics' top line number did see a drop in the year 2020, which was primarily due to the pandemic. Next is the operating income. The operating income is what we get when we subtract the cost of goods and operating expenses from the company's revenue. Back in 2011, the company's operating income was about $4.5 billion. 
and for the year 2020, it's about $5.2 billion. Over the past 10 years, the operating income follows a similar trend as the company's revenue. Next, looking at the net income, the net income is the bottom line of the income statement. This is the amount of money that's left with the company once it has paid for the cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes. Back in 2011, the company's net income was about $3 billion, and for the year 2020, it was about $4.8 billion. Over the past 10 years, the company's net income has stayed positive. In other words, the company has always reported a profit in the past 10 years. Next, looking at the dividends per share. Back in 2011, the company paid out about $0.90 cent per share as dividend. And for the year 2020, it paid about $2.16 per share as dividend. Metronics has been hiking its dividend every year for the past 10 years. And that is definitely something we want to see as shareholders. We want to be investing in companies that is regularly paying and hiking its dividend. Next, looking at the shares outstanding. Back in 2011, Metronics had 1,082 million shares outstanding. And for the chilling 12 months, it had 1,352 million shares outstanding. Ideally, we want the company's shares outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. When a company's shares outstanding number decreases, that tells us that the company is buying back its shares, which actually helps increase the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. Medtronic started buying back its shares after the year 2016, when its share count was about 1,426 million shares. As after that year, the company's shares outstanding number kept decreasing. It decreased all the way to about 1,351 million shares in the year 2020. However, over the past 12 months, the company did issue additional 1 million shares as the share count has now increased to 1,352 million shares. Next, looking at the book value per share. The book value is what we get when we subtract the company's total liabilities from its total assets. Back in 2012, the company's book value was about $16.5 per share. And for the chilling 12 months, it's about $38.23 per share. Over the past 10 years, the company's book value per share has always stayed positive and has been increasing for the most part, which tells us that the company has always had more assets than liabilities on its balance sheet. Finally, looking at the free cash flow, the free cash flow is what we get when we subtract the company's capital spending from the company's operating cash flow. Back in 2011, the company's free cash flow was about $3.2 billion, and for the year 2020, it's about $6 billion. Ideally, we want to see the company's free cash flow number to be staying steady or increasing, and we can see that Medtronic's free cash flow has been trending upwards over the past 10 years. I will be using the past 10 years of free cash flow for my expected rate of return calculation, and I will be using the 2020 figure of $6,021 million for my discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Now let's look at the profitability of the company, focusing on the net margin. The net margin is the ratio of the company's bottom line to its top line, so it compares the company's net income to its revenue. Back in 2011, the company's net margin was about 19.43%, and for the year 2020, it's about 16.56%. What this means is every $100 that the company made in sales in the year 2020, by the time it paid for its cost of goods, operating expenses, non-operating expenses, interest on its debt obligations, and taxes, it had about $16.56 left as pure profit. Ideally, we want the company's net margin number to be staying steady or increasing, and Medtronic's net margin number has always been greater than 10%. Next, looking at the return on equity. The return on equity compares the company's net income to its shareholders' equity. Warren Buffett prefers to only invest in securities that have a return on equity of 8% or greater every year for the past 10 years. Back in 2011, Medtronic's return on equity was about 20.24%, and for the year 2020, it's about 9.50%. We can see that the company's return on equity was much higher from the year 2011 through 2014 than it was after the year 2015. This is primarily because the company issued a lot more shares recently, which means the company's equity portion drastically went up, and when we compare the net income to a large equity portion, we are bound to get a lower return on equity numbers. Next, looking at the return on invested capital. This number gives an idea of how good the management is at allocating the company's capital and getting a return on that investment. Back in 2011, the company's return on invested capital was about 13.32%, and for the year 2020, it's about 7.40%. Medtronic's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 4.6%. And since the company's return on invested capital is greater than the company's weighted average cost of capital, we can safely say that the management is creating value for its shareholders. Finally, looking at the interest coverage. The interest coverage is the ratio of the company's income to its interest obligations. So it gives us an idea of how many times can the company pay off its interest obligations using its income in that calendar year. Back in 2011, the company's interest coverage was 9.27 times, 
and for the year 2020, it's about 4.71 times. Benjamin Graham, the father of value investing, preferred to only invest in securities that had interest coverage of five times or higher. Now let's look at the financial health of the company, focusing on the liquidity ratios. The first item on the list is the current ratio. The current ratio compares the company's current assets to its current liabilities. Ideally, we want the company's current ratio to be greater than 1.5. Back in 2011, the company's current ratio was 1.93, and for the latest quarter, it's at 2.10. Next, looking at the quick ratio. The quick ratio is similar to the current ratio except we disregard the inventory component. In other words, quick ratio is equal to current assets minus inventory divided by current liabilities. A quick ratio greater than 1 tells us that the company does not have to rely on selling its inventory in order to fulfill its current liabilities. Back in 2011, the company's quick ratio was 1.33 and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.58. Ideally, we want the company's quick ratio to be greater than 1.0. Next, looking at the financial leverage. The financial leverage compares the company's total assets to its shareholders' equity. A high financial leverage number tells us that more of the company's assets are financed via liabilities. Back in 2011, Metronix's financial leverage was at 1.91, and for the latest quarter, it's at 1.92. Over the past 10 years, the company's financial leverage has stayed fairly consistent. Finally, looking at the debt-to-equity ratio, this ratio compares the company's total debt to its shareholders' equity. Ideally, we want the company's debt-to-equity ratio to be less than 1.0. It's even better if it's less than 0.5. Back in 2011, the company's debt-to-equity was at 0.51. For the latest quarter, it's at 0.52. Similar to the company's financial leverage, the company's debt-to-equity ratio over the past 10 years has stayed fairly consistent. Now let's look at the efficiency ratios. The first item on the list is the day sales outstanding. This number gives an idea of how many days go by from the day the company recognizes its sales to the date it actually receives cash for that service rendered. Back in 2011, the company's day sales outstanding was about 82 days, and for the year 2020, it was about 69 days. Ideally, we want the company's day sales outstanding number to be staying steady or decreasing. An increasing day sales outstanding number tells us that the company is being aggressive with its accounting as it is aggressively recognizing its revenue so that it can show inflated income numbers on its income statement. However, that is not the case with Medtronic, as we can see that over the past few years, the company's day sales outstanding number has stayed fairly consistent. Next, looking at the day's inventory. This number gives an idea of how many days does Medtronic's product sit in its inventory before it's sold. Back in 2011, Medtronic's product sat in its inventory for about 148 days, and for the year 2020, its product sat in its inventory for about 155 days. Over the past 10 years, the company's day's inventory has stayed fairly consistent. After that, looking at the payables period, this number gives an idea of how many days does Medtronic take to pay its suppliers. Back in 2011, the company's payables period was about 43 days, and for the year 2020, it's about 76 days. Ideally, we want the company's payables period to be staying steady or decreasing. An increasing payables period tells us that the company may be trying to hoard on to its cash in order to artificially inflate its cash flow numbers. Finally, looking at the inventory turnover, this number gives an idea of how many times does Medtronic's inventory go through its system in a calendar year. Back in 2011, the company's inventory turnover was about 2.5 times, and for the year 2020, it's about 2.4 times. Over the past 10 years, the company's inventory turnover has stayed fairly consistent. Now let's compare Medtronic's current valuation to that of the S&P 500. The S&P 500 is the aggregate of the top 500 companies in the United States. The first item on the list is the price to earnings ratio. Medtronic's has a PE of 46.9, whereas S&P 500 has a PE of 26.1. Next is price to book. Medtronic's has a price to book of 3.3, whereas S&P 500 has a price to book of 4.3. Next is price to sales. Medtronic has a price to sales ratio of 5.6, whereas S&P 500 is at 3.1. After that is price to cash flow. Medtronic has a price to cash flow of 27.1, whereas S&P 500 is at 17.2. And finally, the dividend yield. Medtronic has a dividend yield of 1.9%, whereas S&P 500 has a dividend yield of 1.5%. We can see that on three of these five valuation metrics, Medtronic is overvalued when compared to the S&P 500. Hey guys, now let's look at Medtronic's discounted free cash flow DCF analysis. Over here, I pasted the company's 2020 free cash flow number that I got from Morningstar, which is at $6,021 million. I'm assuming the annual growth rate of free cash flow to be 7%. What this means is I expect Medtronic's free cash flow to grow at 7% every year for the next 10 years. I'm using a discount rate of 10%, what this means is I expect this investment to give me a 10% return. I'm using a long-term growth rate of 5%. What 
What this means is I expect Medtronic's free cash flow to grow at 5% every year after the 10 year mark into perpetuity. The company has 1,352 million shares and has a long term debt of $21,976 million. I got this number from the company's balance sheet. After taking all of these inputs into account, we get the intrinsic value to be about $91 per share. And when we compare this intrinsic value to the current stock price of about $124 per share, we can see that the current stock is trading about 36% above the company's intrinsic value. The way we calculate this intrinsic value is we look at what the free cash flows would be every year for the next 10 years. We sum up all those free cash flows which come out to about $52 billion. Then we look at what the free cash flows would be after the 10 year mark into perpetuity. We sum all those up to get the intrinsic value to be about $145 billion. From this number, we subtract the long term debt and divide by the shares outstanding to get the intrinsic value to be about $91 per share. Now, if we disregard the perpetuity component, in other words, if we think that Medtronic is only going to grow for the next 10 years and then it'll cease to exist, then we get the intrinsic value without the perpetuity to be about $22 per share. And if we disregard the debt, in other words, if we think that Medtronic is going to grow into perpetuity and we can just forget about the debt because if the company is going to grow forever, then what's the point of even paying the debt? So if we just disregard the debt, if we think that Medtronic is going to grow into perpetuity, then we get the intrinsic value without the debt to be about $107 per share. Finally, we know that the company's weighted average cost of capital, also known as the company's hurdle rate, is about 4.6%. And if we add a 4% margin of safety on top of that and make our discount rate 8.6%, then our intrinsic value comes to about $135 per share. And we compare this intrinsic value to the current stock price, we can see that the current stock is trading about 8.3% below the company's intrinsic value. Hey guys, now let's look at the expected rate of return calculation for Medtronic. Over here I pasted Medtronic's past 10 years of free cash flows that I got from Morningstar. All the numbers here are in millions of US dollars. This is the yearly free cash flow trend that we get over the years. We can see that over the past 10 years, the company's free cash flow have always been positive. Next, looking at the future data and predictions, I'm assuming that there's a 35% likelihood that Medtronic's free cash flow will grow at 10%. There's a 50% likelihood that its free cash flow will grow at 7%, and a 15% likelihood that its free cash flow will grow at 3%. These are the potential free cash flow rates that we get into the future. After taking into account the numbers of shares outstanding, which is 1,352 million shares, at the current stock price of about $124 per share, we can expect to get an annual return of about 4.4% on this investment. What this means is if you were to purchase a share of Medtronic at the current stock price of about $124 per share and hold the security through 2060, then we can expect to get an annual return of about 4.4% on this investment. Hey guys, now let's wrap it all up. We briefly went over Medtronic's annual report and reviewed the company's four operating groups. We saw how the cardiac and vascular group brought in majority of the company's operating profit. We saw that the company's revenue and operating income have been trending upwards over the past 10 years. Medtronic's net income has been fairly consistent over the past 10 years. Medtronic has been hiking its dividend every year over the past 10 years, which is certainly something we want to see as shareholders. However, the company's shares outstanding number are a lot higher now than they were 10 years ago. In other words, the company is not very aggressive at buying back its shares. In fact, it is issuing more shares, which dilutes the existing shareholders' ownership within the company. Next, we saw that the company's return on equity was subpar, which was primarily because when the company issues more shares, it actually increases the equity portion. So when we compare the net income to a big equity number, we're bound to get lower return on equity numbers. The company's return on invested capital was greater than the company's weighted average cost of capital, which tells us that the company's management is creating value for its shareholders. We saw that Medtronic's interest coverage is usually greater than five times. After that, we looked at Medtronic's current and quick ratio and saw that the company has more than enough current assets to fulfill its current liabilities. Additionally, the company's financial leverage and debt to equity ratios over the past 10 years have been consistent. After that, we looked at the company's efficiency ratios and saw that the company has maintained its efficiency over the past 10 years. Next, we compared Medtronic's current valuation to that of the S&P 500 and found out that on three of the five valuation metrics, Medtronic is overvalued when compared to the S&P 500. When we performed the discounted free cash flow DCF analysis, we found that with a 10% discount rate, the intrinsic value came to about $91 per share. And when we use the 8.6% discount rate, the intrinsic value came to about $135 per share. 
And when we compare that $135 to the current stock price, we can see that the current stock is trading about 8.3% below the company's intrinsic value. Next, when we calculated the expected rate of return calculation, we found out that if we were to purchase a share of Medtronic at the current stock price of about $124 per share, we can expect to get an annual return of about 4.4% on this investment. Overall, Medtronic is a fundamentally strong company and is a leader in its industry. Medtronic has a moat as people are willing to pay a premium when it comes to such health-related products. However, Medtronic is richly priced at the current stock price and it lacks the margin of safety that us value investors seek. And finally, when we think about the opportunity cost, we know that there are other investment opportunities that would be a better bang for your buck than Medtronic. So I would shy away from this overpriced investment. Hey guys, that is all I had for you this week. Hopefully you found this video on Medtronic interesting. If you like this content, please do like, share, comment, and subscribe. And if you have any suggestions as to which stock I should review next, please leave it in the comment section below. I will greatly appreciate it. Thank you.